Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for newcomers, my name's Orville. I'm one of the ministers here. My teammate Katie is with her husband Mike getting some sun this week. And Katie will be back next Sunday. But she's where a lot of us wish we were. It's not very sunny out there. In fact, it looks might be going to snow shortly. Um, we're, ta- we're going into this second in our series of half-truths. And last week we looked at the statement, everything happens for a reason. Today we're looking at this statement, God helps those who help themselves. And somebody suggested, and we could almost link with it at some point, the other statement, another statement that says charity begins at home. And I think that one's only partly true, too. I almost intentionally linked it with God helps those who help themselves, but I'll focus on uh, the one part, God helps those. And to get at that, I want to read a number of scriptures, and I've got some you can see printed on the front cover of the bulletin. Let's just get some historical truths from the Bible into our heads first, and then think our way through this. So this is from the Old Testament. This was probably written, I'm going to guess this comes from oral tradition, 1200 BC. And the early people of God sensed and heard God telling them this, when you reap the harvest of your land, You shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien, the stranger, the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. The last part you recognize is a portion of the Ten Commandments, right? And just before it is this instruction on how you take care of your property, your wealth, and allow others to have some benefit from it. It's almost a command. All right. This is, I believe, from the Psalms. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, God heard my voice, and my cry to God reached God's ears. He reached down from on high, took me, drew me out of the mighty waters. God delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. For they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. You see where this is going. God helps those who help themselves. Well, maybe not always. God brought me out into a broad place. God delivered me because he delighted in me. That was from Psalm 18. And lastly... This is from an early Christian letter, the letter to the Ephesians. And I love this passage. I'll refer to it when we're unpacking all of this. Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Now, verse 9 says it pretty clear, but look at the juxtaposition, the almost immediate 
uh, qualifier in, in verse 10. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I love the, the contrast and the, on the one hand, saved by grace and not by works, but on the other hand, saved for works. And that's, that's part of what we want to get to and unpack this morning. We're going to consider... Again, these things that Christians often say, things we believe that may not be entirely and completely true. They sound right and often they can be supported by some scripture somewhere. But under careful examination, they're found to be at best half-truths. And this gets really complicated, as you can guess already. So, I know that I can't cover it all, and I won't answer all our questions, and you've had experiences that can shed some light on this. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll take one of these. There's a half-page insert, and feel free to scribble down a question, a comment, an experience you've had. We're going to have a little Q&A or Q&C question and comments toward the end of our time. But know that this is available now, and I'm hoping a half an hour from now we're talking about some of the things you've written down. Today we focus on this phrase often recited by Christians and non-Christians alike, God helps those who help themselves. A couple of polls some years ago found that a majority of people believe this phrase came from the Bible or captures a biblical message. But God helps those who help themselves is not, is not in the Bible. It's been around since the ancient Greeks, and it's probably made famous in our North American context by Benjamin Franklin, the American author, inventor, scientist, political leader, Ben Franklin popularized this back in, seven, in the 1730s. So what I want to do is look at one sense in which this is true, and then two senses in which I think it's not true, and see where that gets us to, and then we can talk. This phrase, God helps those who help themselves, does capture one really important truth. We don't sit at the supper table and pray that God will drop food onto our plates, although it'd be nice. Fried chicken would be great. And <laughs> I have my menu, you have yours. That would be a good way, however, if we try and live by that, that, that's a good way to go hungry. I've known people who prayed for a job, and did little to look for work or prepare themselves or improve their skill set. That's a good way to stay unemployed. I have a minister friend who was trying to get a job as a pastor, preacher in a church. I told him several churches that were open. I network with colleagues all over the country. And I told this guy several that were open that he might be able to fit into. He sent one email. They sent back asking for a little more info, and he never answered them. When three months later I asked where things were at in his job search, he said something like, and this is close to verbatim, I told them I was ready to serve. They haven't done anything to clear the way for me to get in. I was ticked, and he knew it. I've quit advocating for him. He's on his own, man. God helps those who help themselves has many examples of that it is true. Last Sunday, I had one of our members come to me in anticipation of this morning and remind me of one of the most dramatic examples of it in 
nearly 100 years. August of 1918, two men were dredging sandbars out on the Niagara River. Do you know where I'm going with this? If you've been to Niagara, you probably have seen the evidence. They were dredging on the Niagara River between Buffalo, below Buffalo and the falls. And at some point, a tow rope broke. And the dredging scow, with them trapped on board, began to be pulled by the current downriver toward the Horseshoe Falls. Some of the details are sketchy, exactly who did what and what order or sequence, but as the scow entered the foaming, foaming rapids above the falls, the men were in a complete panic. It's said, oh, there's a great picture. There it is. How many of you have seen it? Have been, so, okay. It's said that one of the men fell to his knees on the scow and prayed, God, save us. The other guy jumped into action. He cranked open the dredging doors below. Sand spilled out, water poured in, and the scow sank enough for the doors to catch and run aground on the rocks. So who saved them? It's still there above the brink, rusting away. God helps those who help themselves. God's not going to drop food on your table. Force someone to hire you for a job. When you're not ready, trying, qualified, God's not going to make someone spend more. If you're trying to sell your house and you, you want an extra 25 more than it's worth, God's not going to make that happen. In a sense, there's truth to the idea that God does help those who help themselves. God works through people and through our decisions and our actions. Our prayers are meant to empower us for and guide us into action. A huge part of faithful discipleship has an element not of just sitting there holding your hands in your lap. Dilent, diligent action works. I go back to that scripture I was reading to you eight minutes ago. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not, not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, yes, we got that. For we are what God has made, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I believe in the life of faith and trusting God and opening ourselves to God. And then I think we got some work to do. And it ain't all on God to make it happen in our lives or in our world. So all of that acknowledged, I'd like to suggest two contexts or two senses in which this statement gets it wrong. Firstly, this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, it can sometimes be used by people as a way of avoiding helping others. It's their excuse to not sacrifice or befriend or assist. The situations in which in which people find themselves in poverty or financially struggling are not always prone to such simple answers as, well, God helps those who help themselves, so it's up to them. That's not fair, and that's not accurate. And God recognizes this. Again and again in Scripture, we find God calling his people to take concern and take special care for the poor, for the orphan, for the widow, for the refugee, for the needy. It's important to note that in Scripture, God consistently calls us, his people, to help those who cannot help themselves or who require help before, to get them started, 
They require help before they can help themselves. James writes these familiar words in the New Testament. I think they're on the front cover of your bulletin announcement sheet. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. I'll give you a couple other examples. In um, Jesus' teachings, he told a whole bunch of stories. One of them is known as the parable of the sheep and goats. Uh, I think we can put it on screen. Now, this is a really shortened version of it. But Jesus says, at the end of time, um, there'll be a separation, sheep and goats. And he tells this story of people who, who helped. Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? It goes on, when, when did we visit you in prison? And the king, Jesus, answers, Truly I tell you, when you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Or think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, probably the most famous story Jesus ever told. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell into the hands of robbers, stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest comes by, a hired pro-religious leader, comes by and does nothing. Uh, another official of the church comes by and does nothing. And then a Samaritan who were kind of outcast, marginal people comes by. Traveling came near him when he saw him, the man beaten and wounded in the ditch. He was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And Jesus said, to the crowd who he told this parable to, you go and do likewise. Jesus tells us that God judges us not only by our faith, but by our actions. Whether our faith is one that leads us to greater compassion for the poor and the needy, to work with Jesus. God does help those who can't help themselves. And this is very much the character of God. It's all through the scriptures. Hebrew, Old Testament, Christian, New Testament. It's all through the Bible. God cares about the needy and the poor and the orphan and the refugee and the foreigner. This is part of the very character of God. His compassion and mercy for those who are struggling. His ability to discern how someone ends up in poverty or living on the streets or struggling to make ends meet. God knows the whole story. Now, I know that there are wrong ways to help and you can get people caught in a cycle of dependency and we can debate how best to help strategically so they so folks are able to move out and begin to care for themselves. And we do that around here. I want to reassure you, the leaders of our Outreach and Caring Action Team, they work diligently to be strategic with our development and relief work here. Last year, they worked through a study course titled, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor. And it's brilliant and important stuff. So I'm grateful to them, and we can be reassured that the leadership team around here does not waste resources and just throw money or uh, do anything that anyone asks. We think carefully and prudently and find the best ways for long-term, effective, good work. But anyone who thinks they're Christians and pleasing God, yet will have no compassion for those in need and do little to care for them, believing God helps those who help themselves, so you're on your own, pal. They've missed the essential component of Christ's heart and of the gospel. And when I think of God's help of, to those in need, it's clear God doesn't send angels or drop food or clothing or shelter down out of the clouds from heaven. Instead, he puts it on the heart of his people, of us, 
to help. So that's my first big answer in correction to this statement, God helps those who help themselves. I want to go in another direction. We've been talking about physical and development work and material needs and hunger and poverty. I want to go over to the emotional, spiritual, psychological side of us. God helps those who cannot help themselves. And consistently in the Bible... God saves, rescues, and helps human beings who cannot save themselves. This is what Jesus, the complete story of Jesus, was about. God is the God of the hopeless cause. He's the God who loves sinners and broken people. He's the God who walks with us through the darkest valleys. He's the God who brings light into our darkness and peace to our times of anxiety and distress. God rescues, redeems us, and forgives us. And he does that way before we get our act together and our hearts pure and right. God is already working for our renewal, for our healing This help is extended to us even though we don't earn it and can't, and we don't deserve it. There's a word for this, one word that summarizes it, grace. For it is by grace you are saved, rescued, healed, restored, renewed. We need, we humans, have points in our lives where we need two kinds of help that God gives us. The first is what I started with, the physical kind, food, shelter, clothing, um, school, education, psychology, health care. If you remember, and many of you know Maslow's pyramid of hierarchy, the bottom ones have to be cared for the bottom aspects of safety, security, food, shelter, all of those things. God meets those physical needs through communities like ours, through nations like Canada, and through others. We are our brother's and sister's keeper. But on the interior spiritual needs, the emotional and psychological needs for love, for hope, for peace, for comfort, for interior strength, for forgiveness, for meaning and purpose in our lives, our faith in God and God's work by his spirit provide that different kind of help. And again, we find this help is given to those who cannot save themselves, help themselves. I think of the words of the psalmist. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, God heard my voice, and my cry to God reached his ears. He reached down from on high. He took me, he drew me out of the mighty waters. And another one, the psalmist a little later wrote, And this is one of my all-time favorites, 121st Psalm. I lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence does my help come? Not from the mountains. My help comes from the Lord God who made heaven and earth. There are times you can help yourself, and you should. God is counting on you to do so, and to help others, and you should. But you will find in life, if you haven't already, that there are times you cannot, you cannot save yourself. You're in over your head. There's too much pain. There's too much grief. You've lost your way too far. You've lost too much. There are things from which you cannot save yourself. And thanks be to God that God does indeed help those who cannot help themselves. And that includes me and you. This is the picture we have of God in Scripture. In Jesus and all through. A God who sees us, 
when we are broken, when we are at our worst, when we are our weakest or are even our most despicable and most pitiable, and even when we are most afraid and in panic, God reaches down and says, I am here. You matter to me. I will forgive you. There is hope. Your life has meaning. You are loved. And that's what we call grace. And we live in it. We soak it up and we let it flow from us to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, got some good ones. <clears throat> and as I said last week, I'd be lying if I told you I'd given you this a lot of thought. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with a really easy one, and this is the only one where I'll say who wrote it, because D signed it. This is, as some of you may have signed, but I won't read your name, but I know it's okay to read this one. Um, D wrote, I read Matthew 25, 40, the sheep and the goats, you did it for the least of these. I read Matthew 25, 40 just before coming to church this morning in connection with the Syrian refugee announcement. Wow. Cool. All right. Um, I'll just read these and hope I can uh, decipher. This is pretty good penmanship. I tried to help myself for years to no avail. Then I finally found God and said, help me. I cast my cares on to God. God has been able to do in and through me what I was completely unable to do for myself. Still a work in progress, but much happier and feel peace and joy that I never felt before. I continue to cast my cares on God, which I do, which I do the work he has, while I do the work he has led me to do. That's a great comment. Thank you, whoever sent that. Even when we help ourselves or others, isn't that still God at work? God's gift to us. Yeah, if, um, if you carry the Ephesians 2 scripture through to its logical thought process, it is God doing his work through the good works he prepared for us to do. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by, by grace you are saved, and it's a free gift, so no one boasts, but then 9 and 10, if you remember, say, for you are God's workmanship, prepared to do God's work, which he has in advance for us to do. So yes, when, even when we're helping ourselves or someone else, there's a sense in which we are doing, God is helping them, and we are doing God's work. Love, hope, peace, comfort. How do we pursue? How do we provide reassurance to those asking for the above when the help seems to take some time to come from God? There is uncertainty about whether God has heard a prayer. Someone is questioning if God is really listening. How, um, you don't have to put your hands up, but I just think of how many of you, how many of us have prayed and we're not sure if God heard and answered. Eventually things evolve and maybe kind of a little bit sort of work out. But was God in that? And there's that uncertainty. There is uncertainty about whether God has heard a prayer. That's, I'll just say that is one of the mysteries of faith. And to a certain degree, that's why it is faith. You don't always have proof, but you let God work and you trust. Or if I, of, oh, I often see people quote Joel Osteen. How many know Joel Osteen? TV preacher from, I think, Houston or Dallas. 
And I wonder what your take is on prosperity gospel. It seems that he is a little off for me. Um, I, uh, I will confess I have never watched Joel Osteen. He seems to be working while I'm working. <laughs> He's on Sunday morning, isn't he? And I have this job. I never get to see the Sunday morning stuff. But, uh, so I've never seen Joel Osteen, but I've read, I've, I've skimmed through one or two of his books, and that's the extent of my knowledge. But the whole prosperity gospel thing, um, two things. One, I never want to trash... Um, other religious leaders or other faiths unless they're clearly evil. Um, like, I, I'm going to trash the KKK, Ku Klux Klan, right? Uh, but I don't want to dump on Joel Osteen. He may be a little off. My reading of uh, Jesus' life is it ain't prosperity gospel. Jesus had to go through the cross. And then he said to all of his followers, including us, take up your cross and follow me. So I do think our lives work better and run more smoothly and there is more grace and mercy and there is more kindness and peace and meaning if we link ourselves to God and let Christ be at work in our lives. But I don't think if we open ourselves to God and let Christ be at work in our lives, I don't think that solves everything and we're going to get richer and happier and jobs are going to fall into our lap and food from... Go back a half an hour to what I was saying up there. Uh, so I'm not a big proponent of the prosperity gospel as I understand it. All right. We can talk. Uh, any and all of this... I'm happy to dialogue with you out there, and a couple of you send emails this week. Keep doing that. We'll talk. Yes, I believe prayer is the way to helping ourselves. You may not get exactly what you pray for, but the Lord will answer your prayers. God helps, God helps you to help yourself. Your comments... I'm, I'm going to, I will comment, but for 90 seconds, I'm just going to zip it. What do you folks think? Open mic time. Um, yes, I believe prayer is the way to helping yourself. You may not get exactly what you pray for, but the Lord will answer your prayers. God helps you to help yourself. What do you think? Yes? Anybody have... Uh, Further thoughts on that? Okay. I, I do think that's true. Go loud, Rob, and a little longer. Unpack that. <laughs> Yes. Could you hear that? When you're praying for something, um, that may shift you, change you, and you begin to act for something more worthy. Rob, is that? So in a sense, when we pray and ask God to help us, it may change us to help ourselves. So I'm, I'm liking this, and we got to quit. I'm just looking at the clock. Um, I know the band wants to uh, bless us with one more song. I got through most, there's three or four, let me do one more. Can I? Okay. I have no idea what, how does someone decide when to help versus letting someone help themselves? Ooh, good question. Trying to show the path versus letting someone discover their path. This... Um, this is one of the really complicated truths. And this is where our, our outreach and caring action team really studied when helping hurts. There are ways you can help someone 
if you just take care of their problem, they don't grow, they become dependent on you, and it it creates kind of a, a cycle. And that's not what Jesus calls us to. So how does someone decide when to help versus letting someone help themselves? It's wisdom. It's asking God to guide and lead us. You may start help someone get started and then encourage them and support them and befriend them so that they keep going and growing in their own problem solving. All right. Let's quit for today. The next two... I'm going to again hope to have a little Q&C question and comment time.